we uh, find ourselves here in Hebrews chapter 3 this morning. And if you want a laugh, go to our church website and look at the series of Hebrews, look at the pictures, and you'll see the progression of my head uh, in all those pictures through the summer here. So I feel today like I'm kind of channeling Lex Luthor. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we are in Hebrews chapter 3. In chapter 1, we learned that since Christ is God in the flesh, he is therefore superior to the angels. In chapter 2, we learned that since Christ is God, his message is superior to the one given at Mount Sinai. And in chapter 3, we will find Jesus compared to Moses. Now, because all these are references to Judaism, it ought to be obvious by now that the book of Hebrews was written to Jews. I'm trying to make a point about what's going on. The purpose was not to discredit Judaism or to discredit Moses. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. So the purpose is to put Jesus in proper perspective for Jewish listeners. So we're going to start with chapter 3, verse 1. And it uh, looks like we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 to begin with. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Let's pray. Father, help us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. Help us to not just have a mental acknowledgement of facts, but to have a personal involvement of reality. Help us, Lord, to live what you call us to believe. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fix our thoughts on Jesus, who we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He is faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Now, again, starts out with, therefore. you got to figure out what it's there for. So, therefore refers back to chapter 2, and I think specifically verses 11 through 18. And verse 11 says he's not ashamed to call us brothers. Verse 13, he calls us the children that God has given him. Verse 14, he shared humanity with us, the children. Verse 17, he make a, made us like his brothers in every way. In verse 18, he's able to help those, therefore, who are tempted. We are one family. We are children. We are brothers. We are sisters. We're all together in Christ. Now, even the term here in in chapter 3, holy brothers, is a reminder that we share the same calling before God. We are called to be in Christ. Now, you might think, well, the pastor is called, and the missionary is called, and, you know, if we're feeling generous, we could say the deacons are called. But, in fact, you are called to be in Christ. God has called you out. If you've said yes and followed that, you need to recognize it as a holy calling and not just uh, a decision that you put on your form whether you're one political party or another. This is not an earthly thing. This is not something that will last you for the rest of your life or if you feel like changing parties until then. This is eternity. You have made a decision for Christ to stand in Christ. And we need to recognize that as something that is of weight, of eternal glory. We recognize, we fix our thoughts on Jesus because he's not just um, some faraway religious figure. He's not even some guy who started a new religion that we happen to be part of, so we better be partisan, you know, for him. Oh, Jesus. He 
He's our apostle. He's our high priest. Now, these terms may mean something special. Apostle is the term that is used politically to mean a representative from one country to another. Uh, an ambassador is what that word means in political speech. But in religious or spiritual speak, an apostle is someone who represents someone else. Same thing as, as an ambassador, but on a spiritual sense, Jesus represents the Father to the world. And that's his purpose here for us. High priest, every Jew understood that. He was God's representative before the people. In the, when the, in the days of the temple, only the high priest could go face to face with God and only one day of the year. And as a matter of fact, he, if you'll remember, the high priest had to have little bells on the hem of his garment so that as he walked in the holy place before God, people outside could hear that he was still walking around. And you're wondering, what's the significance of that? Well, what if God killed him? And then he got a dead body laying in there in the holy place. Now we got a problem. Well, he also had to have a very long sash around his waist, trailing the end out, so that if God decided to strike the high priest dead in the holy holy place, nobody could go in there and bring his body out. So he had to hang him out of that, the end of that sash so they could drag him back out. That's how special it was. That only the high priest, only one day a year could go in there. And if God killed him dead, nobody could go in there after him. He had to be dragged out by his garments. That's the significance in the Gospels. At the resurrection when it says, The veil of the temple was torn in two opening the way to the Holy of Holies. And God did that. Peter didn't go in there and do that. John, John and James didn't go in there and do that. They were running off hiding somewhere. God did that. Opening the way so that you, not the high priest for you, you could go before God. You don't even need me to go before God for you. You can do it. And that is the significance of being in Christ. It's powerful. You take it, and I take it, for granted. But to the early people, the early Christians, to the Jews, it was blasphemous. To the Christians, it was amazing that God would do such a thing. So, Jesus, the, the writer tells us, was faithful before God, just like Moses. And he's making this comparison on purpose, because Jewish people wouldn't understand that. It's not an incidental, throwaway comparison. He's making an important comparison here. Moses delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt. Jesus delivers us from bondage to sin. The first one was very physical. They were prisoners, slaves in Egypt, and Moses made it possible for them to be delivered out of that slavery and into very physical freedom so that they could become a nation that God called them to be. Jesus delivers us from that eternal bondage to sin, to being separated from God. God did it first physically so that when he did it spiritually through Jesus, his son, we would get the comparison. We would understand that. And the writer of Hebrews is purposely comparing those two pictures. Verse 3. Jesus has been found worthy of higher honor, greater honor than Moses. Just as the builder of the house is greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Again, making a comparison so that we'll get the picture here of what's going on. Jesus is superior to the angels. He's superior to the law. And he's superior to the great lawgiver, Moses. Now, that's not a put down of angel, the law, or Moses. It's rather a declaration of who Jesus really is. 
Now, you might say, well, here's this guy, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, and we say he's greater than Moses and the law and the ages. So that's to a Jew, that's an insult. But when you say Jesus, this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, is God in human flesh, well, of course he's superior. If he's God, he has to be, because nothing is superior to God. So Moses was called by God to deliver Israel, and he received the law from God on Mount Sinai, and he spoke with God face to face, but he didn't deliver Israel by his own power. He didn't, well, as a matter of fact, he decided one day, saw an Egyptian mistreating a Jew, said, I'm going to save my people. And so he killed the Egyptian, and ta-da, now he's a criminal, and he's running away and hiding. His plan didn't work. And it was not until 40 years later when God sent him back that what he had desired to do actually came about because of God's power. He didn't negotiate the law with God. He didn't sit down and say, okay, God, uh, we'll, we'll do this and this. And no, God says, uh, I want you to do Oh, no, God, that's too much. Let's, he didn't negotiate it. God said, here it is. And all Moses did was bring it back to Israel to ratify it. He didn't speak with God as an equal, though he did speak with God face to face. He was the friend of God, but he was also the servant of God. <clears throat> Jesus is superior. He's superior to Moses, not by what he does, but by who he is. He's God. Just as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Obviously, Frank Lloyd Wright's house, Falling Water, is amazing. But it's amazing because Frank Lloyd Wright designed it. The Gamble House down in Pasadena is a beautiful, amazing house. But the people who designed and built that house have greater honor because they did that. Moses is a great man. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And again, as I often say here, he's not kind of God. He's not God junior grade. He's God with no exceptions placed on that. No caveats. Not God, but this. Not sort of God. But he's God, full stop, period. My, my theology professor would say, He's large font, bold face, capital letters, italicized, underlined in red with highlights. God. Verse 5. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Again, simply com completing the comparison here. Moses was a great servant in God's house. Now it's necessary for the writer of Hebrews to go in all of this detail because Jews saw Moses as the epitome, the highest. Who could be any better than Moses? Even though they looked for God's promised prophet who would come, come about and be like Moses, they still saw Moses as the highest. He's the greatest. Who could be better? It would be like some American saying that whoever the current president is is greater than George Washington. Well, I don't care what you say. That's just not right. George Washington's the father of his country. That's all there is to it. And Moses is a great man, and he's worthy of our respect. He was the one God chose to go through all of those trials and deliver Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. He's the one God chose to send in the desert and give him the law to give to the people. And when God was so mad with Israel, he was ready to destroy them Moses is the man God listened to and said when Moses said, please God, don't do this. It'll make you look bad. And God in his grace listened 
to Moses' response. Matter of fact, to, to show you how great that is, in the book of Jeremiah, when God is prophesying the doom of Israel and the destruction coming on Jerusalem, he says to Jeremiah, even if Moses stood before me and prayed for these people, I wouldn't relent. Moses is the greatest of the servants in God's house. But Jesus is greater. Why? Because the son is greater than the servant. No matter how great he is. Do you remember? Robin does, but he doesn't count. What's, <laughs> what's the name of Abraham's servant that was going to inherit everything? Because Abraham didn't have a son. Now you don't remember. He's a great servant. But as soon as Isaac arrived, who cares about that guy? Not Ishmael, he doesn't count. No, no, there was somebody about of Damascus. See, he knew. <laughs> Eliezer of Damascus. But the son of the master is greater than any servant, no matter how great that servant is. The writer of Hebrews is making this... I tell you what, he's beating you to death with this point. He does not want you to miss his point. As great as Moses is, Jesus is greater because as great as Billy Graham is, God is greater. I guess that's the best I can come up with today. He's the son of of the owner of the house, of the, the designer of the house, of the builder of the house. And guess what? Here's where he comes back to you and me. You and I are that house. We are that family. We are that house. Those are pictures to help us grasp the concept here of what's going on. We belong to God. He's building us. He owns us. But we're family as well. So we've come from verse 1 to verse 6 in full circle. We talk about the preacher being called, but we are called the body of Christ, the house of Christ, the church of Christ. We are called to be in Christ. And God's calling does not mean that you got to stop doing what you're doing. you got to go somewhere and be a Christian somewhere. You are God's house no matter where you're at. You are God's presence. Holy Spirit dwells inside you. God's presence is wherever you are. You are God's kingdom wherever you are. You carry that around. You're a mobile proclamation of God no matter where you go. The writer is exhorting us to have the courage not just to believe, but to live for Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our days. He is the hope for which we boast. If you have never given your life to Jesus, I charge you to receive, to believe, to bow down and surrender to him. Christian, I charge you to start fresh. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy for us to say words. Lord, help us to be more than just spoken words, but help them to be your word and the power to move and change our lives and hearts. Father, help us to go from this place carrying the word you've given us, carrying the power of the Spirit within us, carrying the kingdom wherever we go. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise King, come on.